Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah. Cheap ball eight. There, there it is. Just rolls over. Really nasty. So unlucky. In sports and, uh, and injuries, then it's a big part of your practice. In the US, they've got a speciality called sports medicine, and at least half of their training is dedicated to foot and ankle injuries. So they're terribly common in all sort of contact sports, non-contact sports, netball. And I'll go through some statistics a bit later, but uh, <clears throat> what we're gonna cover is um, sort of a basic overview of ankle sprains and chronic lateral ankle instability and syndesmosis injuries without fracture. And then uh, of course, perineal tendon tears and dislocations are are pretty common in sports, but we don't really have time to cover all of that. And there's another lecture on, on um, tendon problems, which covers that topic. And then some impingement problems and, uh, and turf toes. And it's certainly not all encompassing. Um, there are lots of other pathologies that could be included in sports injuries, like um, obviously Lisfranc injuries, which is covered in, in another lecture. But um, things like stress fractures and Achilles tendonitis, tendinopathies, anterior tibial tendinopathies, tibial tendon tears, uh, accessory navicular, lots of things that can be aggravated during sports. So we can't cover them all. But most textbooks will have a whole chapter on, certainly um, foot and ankle textbooks will have a whole ch chapter on sports medicine. And they'll also include osteochondral lesions and medial instability, bone stress, stress fractures, which uh, we can't really cover in, uh, on a Tuesday night. Uh. So <clears throat> starting with the lateral ligament injuries, really nice to understand the anatomy very clearly, um, particularly with regards to the lateral ligaments. If you can see the ATFL is a very horizontal ligament resisting anterior translation of the, of the talus under the tibia. So to, for me, it's a bit like the um, ACL of the, of the ankle in that it stops the talus coming forward. So similarly, the ACL stops the tibia from going forward on the, on the femur. And uh, there are a lot of proprioceptive fibers, fibers in that ligament, a bit like the ACL. And although it seems to be one, it's two ligaments with two, two divisions. And it's intimately related to the CFL. It's almost like a common origin in the more inferior bundle. With the CFL being a very vertical ligament, sort of running at 130 degrees from the ATFL. And these two, obviously, the main stabilizers of the lateral um, ankle and the first tear in, in an ankle injury. And the medial side, the deltoid is much more complex with deep and superficial components and also intimately related to the spring ligament and the tail and navicular capsule. And uh, that's another whole subject dealing with medial instability, which is much less common, but um, a problem that we don't really have the greatest solutions for, but uh, I'll have to touch on that in, in another talk there. And to look at the, the syndesmosis, it's a sort of broad fan-shaped ligament distally with um, the interosseous ligament component, which you can't see, and the, the posterior component, making up the three components of the, of the syndesmosis. And um, we're gonna go into some of those injuries a bit later. So it's really nice to look at these very detailed dissections by um, a Spanish anatomist, uh, Galano. But ankle sprains and ankle injuries are super common. I mean, all of us have had one, whether we've been sober or not, and um, they generally heal pretty well um, in most instances. Like a three, 300,000 patients will present to a &E's in the UK with ankle sprains and 30% um, of all soccer injuries and the highest number of loss of days playing in the, a in the um, Premier League are due to ankle sprains, ankle injuries. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, with increasing athletic participation and trail running and um, with um, people 
doing contact sports till older, playing masters hockey and squash and paddle, whatnot. The, the incidence is certainly rising, and that's been shown over these longitudinal studies. And, um, you know, about 30 to 40 percent of people who have quite a significant sprain will have some sort of residual ankle symptoms. Not all of them might need surgery, but they just know that their ankle has had some, had some trauma going forward for, for, for a persistent period of time. So they're not pretty, not that benign. So when you get into private practice or even in casualty, sort of seeing patients downstairs, you're going to get the odd ankle sprain and uh, you're going to get consulted. The, the casualty doctor is going to ask you to take a look at a patient with ankle sprains. So you're going to need, need to know what the optimal evidence-based treatment is. Um, we all just fob them off as a soft tissue injury, but I think you've got to treat them properly. We look for associated injuries. The best sort of treatment is a short period of immobilization. So that's a week or so with, um, with the ankle splinted or braced in the 90 degree position. Remember, if the foot goes into plant flexion and the ATFL stretches out or the gap between the ruptured ends increases or the gap between where it's pulled off the bone increases. So you've got to try and keep that ankle at 90 degrees and then early controlled weight bearing. Prolonged casting and prolonged periods in a boot, prolonged non-weight bearing are all have all been shown to be negatively predictive of a good outcome. They cause atrophy, poor collagen um, regrowth, and then poor proprioception and uh, prolonged return to sport. So we did a survey of how orthopods treat uh, grade three lateral ligament injuries. And because of the wide range and ages and lack of reading evidence, there's uh, obviously this wide range of, of treatments, but fortunately, a large percentage do follow the ankle brace regime, which I'll show you another meta-analysis shows that that's probably the best way of treating them in the short term. So what are the outcomes of an ankle sprain? Well, you know, most of them will heal. So patients will ask you, will I be the same again? And you can say that you have a 75 to 80% chance of being pretty, pretty normal after a grade two or grade three injury, but at 20 25% chance of having chronic lateral ankle instability or having some symptoms in your ankle. And a repeat injury is the greatest predictor of, of a recurrent instability. Of course, there are lots of other problems that you need to look out for, like osteochondral lesions. You may develop a soft tissue impingement, peroneal tendon tears, small avulsion fractures from the tip of the fibula or from the anterior process of the calcaneus can lead to sort of delayed recovery to so look out for those pathologies there. How do I manage an ankle sprain? Well, I try and use evidence. And this is the meta-analyses done by um, the, the group in Amsterdam. And they looked at a couple of randomized controlled trials looking at boots versus braces versus nothing. And it seems that a four week period in a brace wearing a 24 seven, even when you sleep, because one, when one sleeps, your foot goes into plantar flexion. And as your foot goes into plantar flexion, the talus drifts forward with the, um, and the Achilles overpowers the anterior tibial tendon. The talus subluxes anteriorly, and there you've got your draw test, and the ATFL heals a little longer. And the talus then has this predisposition to, to drift forward, and chronic lateral ankle instability is a, is a result. So, if the one take-home message with treating acute ankle sprains is to try and keep them at 90 degrees for a couple of weeks while that ligament becomes sticky and the, the sort of scar tissue kicks in there. We evaluate these patients and if there's a plateau in recovery, I ask the physios or the rehab team just to send them back to me for an MRI scan. They should generally, even after grade three sprain, be weight-bearing after two weeks. They should be... Uh, maybe coming out of the brace with activities of daily living at six weeks, but wearing it for a couple of months during sport just to prevent another injury. And if there's a plateau in recovery, so there's failure to weight bear or there's um, there's a inability to return to sport sort of eight to 12 weeks later, then 
we get an MRI scan to look for bone bruising, osteochondral lesions, and other fractures, peroneal tendon tears that we may have missed on clinical examination. Just going back to that examination, it's very, very difficult in the acute phase to examine someone with a swollen ankle, is bloody sore. The best is to examine them five or six days later when the swelling's down and uh, they're a little less tender. You can work, try to work out exactly where, where most of the pain is, medial, lateral, syndesmosis, ATFL only, to get a better, uh, better understanding. There's a small subgroup of patients that perhaps do a bit better with surgical repair. And these are the professional athletes with very little leeway to tolerate instability and those that are making a living from what they do. Um, we looked at a um, number of athletes who had conservative and functional rehab, uh, sorry, and um, surgical treatment and found that they returned to sport about two to three weeks earlier if they had surgery. If you look at this um, cricketer, you can see, imagine if he's got any ankle instability, you can see how that talus will be drifting forward. And uh, certainly with fast bowlers, you want that ankle super stable. And perhaps if they have an ankle injury, you know, I have treated a few of these professional cricketers, we tend to repair the ligaments so that uh, try and offset the incidence of, of chronic lateral ankle instability. Yeah. So associated injuries um, are, are numerous and varied. And I think a lot of these land up with um, that group where the ankle is not quite right, it's not um, 100%. They may have subtle, what we call micro instability, where on clinical examination, it's not gross, but it's just a bit looser than they usually, usually have, and it generates inflammation and synovitis in that anterolateral gutter. And with that inflammation, you can develop impingement syndromes and a, a Bassett's lesion. A Bassett's lesion is a Basically, I'll show you one now in an arthroscopic um, photo of where the inferior part of the AITFL tears and a little sort of loose ligament falls into the joint and causes an, an impingement. Um, and then lots of other things that can cause ongoing pain. So this is a um, classic Bassett's lesion here. You can see in the corner, which sometimes flops into the joint. It's usually with um, a... Uh, uh, external rotation type injury, but you can certainly get an um, involvement of the inferior syndesmosis with a supination type of injury and then a couple of other pathologies that can be associated. So just, just look out for that. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, so in, in summary, treating a acute ankle sprain, delayed examination, short period of immobilization, wearing an ankle brace 24 7 at night as well. If the patient has been prescribed a moon boot, that's okay as well. But then they need to wear that moon boot even when they sleep and that, that um, compliance becomes tricky. So I don't, as a first line, unless it's a severely unstable situation or they have a fracture or something, I don't usually prescribe a moon boot. I think those ankle speed braces, those lace up braces are just as good as at immobilizing the joint. And, uh, and they can keep the ankle sort of 90 degrees there. So I'm going to move on to chronic lateral ankle instability. So there are two definitions that I'd like you to just understand. One is um, mechanical instability. So that's objective. That's what the examiner feels as per this um, draw test here. And that's how I like to do the draw test, not, not cupping the, the calcaneus like we see in, um, in a lot of uh, do many videos and in um, in um, on the textbooks where they you know you cut, I like to put my fingers on the neck of the talus, pull the talus and the calcaneus forward. I can feel then that the two bones are moving forward under the tibia. And then then there's this entity of functional instability. So this is subjective. It's what the patient tells you. They say the ankle's not right. It gives away. They have repeat sprains or it's painful over the ligaments. Um, they don't trust their ankle. Walking downstairs is tricky. Sometimes there's uh, there are other extrinsic factors there. And um, moving on to stress views. Well, it's a bit controversial. I don't really do stress views in many instances because I don't find um, that it's really it changes my management. 
if a patient has um, functional instability, so they have a couple of these symptoms, they have mechanical instability on my examination, so I compare it to the other side, and perhaps some other intrinsic factors like hyperligamentous laxity or they have a, an alignment problem, then I don't really need stress views to, to make the diagnosis. Certainly stress views are one that you make include in your exam answer, where if there's more than 10 degrees difference in the tailored tilt test compared to the other side, or more than um, 10 mils of anterior translation on the lateral view during the draw test, it may be seen as a positive examination. Now. So how do I treat patients with chronic lateral ankle instability? Well, I always ask them what the first injury was like and if they had any treatment at the time. So whether they had an external rotation injury, if they had no moon boot, a boot, they just walked it off or they were running with the bulls in Pamplona and were too drunk, you know, lots of information you can get from their first injury and how swollen it was or how unstable it was. And then, uh, and then when it started becoming more chronic, some of these patients will say they they had um, they had no repeat injuries, just never was right, and of course they've just got this micro instability that they can't carry on and play sports with. And obviously, ask about other joints, shoulders, knees, and if they've had any injuries there. Many of these patients have had shoulder dislocation with chronic um, instability, and uh, get a feel for their hyperligamentous laxity and do a bite and score if you think so and look for these things so i always the patients think i'm a bit mad when when they sit on the bed and uh, the first thing i do is i take their hand and i bend their thumb back and they go, you know that's you know my ankle's the problem but i think you get a feel for how loose people's collagen is sometimes even if you touch those marfanoid type people with them um, if you grip their skin you can feel the collagen is really inferior and you know even a single sprain might land up in a chronic instability problem and then there are those with serious malalignment issues which need to come into your treatment algorithms which often may include a sort of bony reconstruction so and then on the examination after you've taken that detailed history you want to look at uh, the whole limb from top to bottom look for alignment various valgus genu and ankle and hind foot look for the foot shape so whenever someone comes in with a neutral hind foot so not valgus or varus and they have a history of ankle sprains then i know that this is perhaps a bit more worrying in that they have a mechanical disadvantage they have cavus to, together with that um, hind foot varus then they may also have problems with the peronia. It leads you on to a pattern recognition. And um, in many of these instances, you pick up a whole bunch of pathologies. So this is where you must feel, check the peroneals, the CFL, ATFL, put your fingers over the anterior process of the calcaneus, fifth metatarsal, of course, check for other injuries. Also assess for medial instability. And then, um, and then remember the Achilles tendon, I can't believe, how many patients have been referred over the years who have been diagnosed as having an ankle sprain that actually ruptured, ruptured the Achilles tendon. So just don't be caught out. Just put your fingers on there and see that ten, the tendon's intact. Because Achilles tendon ruptures tend to cause a lot of swelling after two or three days. Patients, as well as the examiner, get a bit confused and they say, gee, you sprained your ankle. Meanwhile, it actually ruptured the Achilles completely. Yeah. So most, well, I wouldn't say most, but a, a fair percentage of patients with chronic lateral ankle instability, once they know the diagnosis, can be treated with conservative treatment, which is functional rehabilitation, perhaps wearing a brace for um, the season, or when they're walking on uneven ground or doing sports that aggravates the ankle. Some are happy to modify their activities, Orthotics can play quite a big role in those patients with malalignment. So if they have a various malalignment, then a lateral heel person of getting them to run or walk on camber. I think if you can develop a good physiotherapy, biokineticist team, 
can certainly avoid surgery in a large, not a lot, in, in a fair number of these patients, getting the balance and strength right there. When that fails and when, when do we pull the trigger? Well, I, you, you tell the patients, look, if you're getting recurrent sprains and the ankle's filling up with blood or it's becoming swollen with an effusion, you're getting chronic pain over the ATFL, then there's ongoing chondrolysis technically because the chondrocytes are not in a good homeostasis. There's release of all those metalloproteinases and we know that ankle, ankle arthritis uh, isn't something that just happens out of the blue. It's usually secondary to trauma or instability. So you can, you know, if the patient has an angry, um, swollen ankle, then you can convince them that perhaps surgical stabilization could put off an ankle fusion or replacement in time. So as you could see, if there are 20,000 ankles, sorry, 60,000 ankle sprains in America every single day, multiply that by 365, even if 20% of those have instability, that's a lot of pathology. That's a lot of money and a lot of work. And that's probably one of my most common operations is treating chronic lateral ankle instability. And then the surgical management, well, then the surgical um, decision-making boils down to a few things. One, the alignment of the patient, of course, because you may need to realign the bony anatomy. And two, the soft tissue that you that you got to deal with. And uh, the main gold standard of treatment is the brostrum Gould or Brostrom ligament tightening or ligament repair, modified by Gould, which is really just augmenting the repair by advancing the advancing the, the um, extensive retinaculum onto the fibula. Then uh, when the tissue is not great or it's a revision procedure, or if the patients have hyperligamentous laxity, they're obese, they have a bit of varus, then you may then choose to perform a ligament reconstruction. That gets a bit more technical and um, you need to have some skills to manage soft tissue properly. And uh, the ligament reconstructions are either anatomical or non-anatomical. I'm not even gonna mention the non-anatomical um, options because they're not really done much anymore. The non-anatomical reconstructions are tenodesis type um, reconstructions using the peroneal tendons to bridge from the fibula to the fifth metatarsal, they're quite complex. And longitudinal studies have shown quite a high incidence of subtalar arthritis and even ankle arthritis because they think they, they got too tight and um, they immobilize the ankle. So they're not really done so much anymore. So now there's a big swing to anatomical reconstruction and also arthroscopic repair and arthroscopic reconstruction. So um, I find that I can do the even anatomical reconstruction through a three centimeter incision. So I don't find there's a huge advantage to doing an open versus um, arthroscopic. Air. And uh, of course you can use different grafts, um, alo or auto. Uh, so I, I personally have got quite used to using the anterior half of peroneus longus as a graft when the tissue is not great to, to do a standard brostrum. And I uh, found it really um, great at giving primary stability with a anchor in the um, and a blind tunnel in the neck of the talus, bringing it through the fibula and getting a getting a really nice reconstruction of the ATFL. If the CFL is unstable as well, and usually, interestingly, when you examine these patients, you'll find the anterior draw test is very. Um, positive, but then you do the tailor tilt test with the ankle in neutral, it's not as positive. And that's because the fibula acts as a, a really good buttress. So if the talus can't come forward, then it's relatively stable. And if you look at a lot of these MRIs, you'll find the ATVL is gone and the CFL is actually quite a nice robust ligament, um, which you can then either advance or, or, or maybe just tighten up with the, with the bone anchor. So I would say in about 20% of cases, I'll do the CFL as well as the ATFL, but 80% of the cases you just reconstruct the ATFL and then do a brostrum on top of the, um, on top of the repair. What about internal bracing? Well, this is pretty topical and common. 
It's very easy to do. It's easy to cock it up as well if you don't know your landmarks or if you make it too tight. This is a non-biological splint, which can, in theory, stress shield the healing ATFL. So the way it works is that you do your brostrum type of pen and over the brostrum you put the ATFL uh, splint or, or internal brace. Uh, I think the advantages are that you can then you know, mobilize the patient a bit sooner afterwards because there's a strong fiber tape um, and it's not going to put much stress through your healing ligaments and through the sutures that you placed um, in your brostrum. <clears throat> Certainly in a professional uh, sports person, I sometimes do do this to try and get speed up their return to play. But um, I have also had to remove a couple because they were put in the wrong place. One in the subtalar joints, another one was a bit tight. So not without, um, without its shortcomings. And um, yeah, there's certainly been a bit like most things in, lit in the literature, you can kind of prove a lot of different things. We don't have any randomized controlled trials looking at internal brace versus graft versus just a standard brostrum. You just look at case series, and there, there are some case series that show um, pretty good results from internal yeah. brace. So okay. In this case, you must stay with the anterior draw tester. What are the outcomes of lateral ligament reconstruction? Well, if you look at Rick Ferkel's uh, two-year studies from just brostrum reviews, pretty good, 92% return to, to sport. Um, but then it tends to tail off as, um, as the years go by with longer term follow-up and even a 10-year follow-up, you'll find that that excellent outcome re reduces down to about uh, 70%. So the, I've got a little bit of a problem with uh, the brostrum reconstruction in some instances when for those reasons I listed poor tissue, varus, hyperligamentous laxity, obesity, I tend to use a graft. I find it much more secure and uh, we're busy with a big series about 45, 48 patients who've had that perineus longus graft, anatomical graft, and we're looking at their patient reported outcomes at two and five years, so um, watch the space there. Um, obviously, if they have osteochondral lesions and they have malalignment, which, in, which, which may include various osteotomies, their patient report outcomes are worse. It's just a bit of an interesting, crazy case. We needed a um, big reconstruction. So what about uh, <clears throat> this case here? This is a totally different animal and uh, one that's a bit more worrying when uh, in a contact situation, there's an external rotation moment. So in contact sports like rugby, NFL, um, where there's a lot of uh, Aussie rules, all these sports have reported high incidences of, of syndesmosis injuries without fracture, where there's an external rotation moment. If you look at the, what fails in these rotation injuries, the deltoid, anterior deltoid is stretched and then the eight, AITFL is torn into osseous ligaments torn, and if it carries on going, then the deltoid really tears, and then the, the PITFL tears. So it's a 360 degree injury in many instances. So this is Dwayne Vermeulen getting tackled by Peter Steff toy um, just before the Lion series, and he didn't have such a good situation there. Pretty unstable syndesmosis and a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of fiber tape and and stuff there to make him stable. So up to 20% of ankle sprains have some syndesmosis involvement and the severity is quite variable. Um, they have a high incidence of osteochondral lesions and deltoid instability if you have a syndesmosis injury, which goes without saying because of that um, external rotation moment. But they're quite heterogeneous and a bit unpredictable. So it's a bit difficult to tell patients that you know, you're going to take six weeks to get back to play when it may be 16. So in the playing varsity cup or professional or whatnot, they want to know how long it's going to take to recover. I can usually say with an isolated ATFL injury that they'll probably be playing at six to eight weeks time with a syndesmotic injury. It's a bit of a thumb suck. So it's a bit heterogeneous. So. 
The problem is that if we if we get it wrong, if we miss the diagnosis, which happens about 20% of the time, or if we undertreat them, or if patients are left with chronic latent and um, syndesmosis instability, they have chronic pain, they develop this hypertrophic synovitis in the anterolateral gutter, um, they can certainly develop heterotopic ossification and Interestingly, in many of these cases, they don't have the classic diastasis that you're aware of with failing syndesmosis and Taylor shift. A lot of them have sagittal instability. And I'll show you a few arthroscopic videos now where the fibula moves more in the sagittal plane because the AITFL and the interosseous ligament are incompetent. And that, in effect, is a draw test. So if you think of the ATFL attaching to the, to the fibula, and you pull on the on the talus, and it moves the fibula with the talus. So they have this chronic uh, instability there which, with, with dysfunction. Uh, just recapping that anatomy very closely related to the to the ATFL. But usually um, on examination, you'll find they'll have pain a bit higher up. So it just leads me on to another sort of diagnostic difficulty. One, it's very clear that the syndesmosis is torn and these. Um, highly unstable fracture dislocations, even in this diastasis with no fracture, you can see the tail has shifted, the deltoids obviously torn. But in these cases, there can be a significant injury even with normal radiographs. And we know that the fibula moves about three degrees of motion in the sagittal plane, it rotates about five degrees, and um, it, in terminal dorsiflexion, the tail is, pushes the fibula lateral about three to five millimeters. So these are micro motion, micro movements, which you cannot detect on, on uh, fluoroscopy unless it's grossly unstable like these cases, but they may still have significant latent um, instability with big injuries on the medial and the lateral side. So we came up with this algorithm um, that if you can put a shaver blade between the tibia and the fibula arthroscopically, then you could certainly 100% guarantee that the this is a 4.5 4 millimeter shaver between the tibia and the fibula. You can be sure that there's a significant syndesmotic injury, but that's an arthroscopic determination. But on clinical examination, um, we found that if there's a, if there's a deltoid ligament injury and an external rotation test positive, and there's a squeeze test positive. Then they have what's called a 2B, sorry, this is with a normal radiograph, they've got a 2B syndesmotic injury, which based on, on the study should get um, surgical stabilization. So what we really found, and this was echoed in the consensus meeting that followed this paper, that if you have a medial injury and a lateral injury with pain up the syndesmosis, you probably should at least do an arthroscopy, determine the instability and fix that uh, instability. And then I'm not going to go into the details of how to fix it, but you really just want to make that um, fibula stable in the incisura with an anatomical reduction. And um, we know now that um, dynamic fixation with buttons tends to have a slightly better outcome with scoring in ankle fractures. And I think that's the same with patients who don't have a fracture with unstable syndesmotic injuries. So this is showing a case um, with, with significant looking at the fibula across there with the instability and then following the tightrope, you can see it's, uh, it's really you know, quite nice and stable. And uh, this is that consensus paper showing that if there's an, a syndesmotic injury, but the deltoid is intact, and this can also be seen on, on MRI, then it's a stable injury. You can treat them non-surgically and that's a two weeks non-weight bearing in a boot and then six weeks followed in the boot, walking with physio, avoiding external rotation dorsiflexion. If there's a syndesmotic injury on external rotation squeeze and there's any pain of the delta, they get a scope and then proceed if need be. If you can put your scope between the fibula and the tibia, then it's unstable and, uh, and then they get a tight rope there. So the, these ankle sprains are super common. Yeah, I'm just re repeating what I was saying there. So. I'm going to move on to um, ankle impingement syndrome. So footballer's ankle, this is uh, 
probably much less common than the previous two pathologies. Uh, it's um, usually a projection of the distal tibia or a spur on the neck of the talus causing a jamming um, in terminal dorsiflexion. The etiology is probably traction or repeated dorsiflexion injuries causing hyper hypertrophic bone or bone to grow um, in the capsule. And there's different grades, grade one to four, four being with arthritis and grade one being three, less than three millimeter spur. It's a McDermott grade. Um, the cause of the impingement can be either soft tissue or bone or combination. So the soft tissue impingements are what I showed earlier, that Bassett's type lesion, often synovitis or thickening of the scarred anterolateral capsule you can get a plica or meniscoid type lesion, which cause pain usually with, it's actually interestingly more painful in terminal plantar flexion as the capsule gets pushed onto the lateral talus shoulder. And then the bony pathologies, loose bodies, those osteophytes, tail and neck spur are more painful in terminal dorsiflexion. You can obviously get a combination of those two. And there's a CT scan showing just that. Um, in, in these uh, traction osteophytes or these anterior spurs here, you got to look out for anterior ankle instability. Whenever you see osteophytes around a joint, you've got to ask the question, why is there an osteophyte there? And it's either because it's early degeneration or arthritis or instability. So you can take away this bony spur, open or endoscopically, oh, sorry, arthroscopically, but if you don't treat the ankle instability, then you, you might even make them worse because then the ankle can escape more. And it's a way of the joint saying, trying to, trying to limit motion in, in the joint. The reason why these spurs are a problem in many instances is, is even obviously the impingement symptoms symptoms are, are one, but sometimes they cause a projection that actually rubs onto the, onto the tailor body, onto the dome and cause this, what's called tram tracking. And um, if they have symptoms uh, and, they see, and you see this tram tracking, it makes you a little bit more worried about instability. But of course, you want to get rid of that insult because that's just going to lead to more chondrolysis and, and problems there. And sometimes you can get se severe rhino horns on the tail and neck as well. And in many supinated or cavivarous type of people, you can get these big spurs on the talus. Uh, neck, which can impinge on the medial malleolus and on the medial side. I find definitely patients with these medial tailor spurs, they really respond well to either open or arthroscopic resection. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's quite a, quite a quick recovery. Yeah. There's another entity called uh, Taylor's fibula impingement that's a bit more uncommon, where there's a lateral projection to the Taylor's shoulder on the lateral process, which rubs on the fibula. It's a bit more lateral and a bit harder to treat. You actually almost have to osteotomize the lateral shoulder of the, of the tailor, sir. These are some pictures of that Bassett's type lesion, which I showed you, where the AITFL tears in a sprain and uh, falls into the joint, gets kind of gets stuck there, cause chronic pain, very easy to sort out um, arthroscopically. And there's a picture of a soft tissue plica. Remember, after an ankle sprain, the whole joint fills with blood and you get these various scar bands as well that can cause soft tissue impingement. Uh, or you can, this is a classic picture of um, a soft tissue impingement from a chronic lateral ankle instability with uh, this sort of fibrinous type tissue falling into the joint, causing an uh, impingement and pain on, on terminal dorsiflexion. And um, yeah, so how do you make the diagnosis? Well, all of those things in the history and then um, the CT scans are pretty useful investigation. Some of these little um, bony avulsions quite hard to see on lateral view because they're a bit medial. And so Van Dyke described an external rotation plantar flexion view to see that anteromedial um, bony spur that projects from the medial malleolus. 
in some instances, you may want to get an uh, a CT scan to see the bone and also get an MRI scan to make sure that you're not dealing with significant chondral pathology. And this is how I do it. You know, some of you have seen the way I windsurf with um, <clears throat> dynamic traction and you can really then control the distraction and uh, get rid of that um, get rid of that spur. This is an example with a big Taylor Taylor spur here, and this is the distal tibia. Um, this is a distal tibia spur being removed with a small osteotome, making it nice and smooth, clearing that impingement. So yeah, that's a uh, anterior impingement. I'm going to move on to posterior impingement. So the um, anatomy at the back of the ankle is terribly complex. I mean, there are multiple sites for potential impingement or sites that can cause pain or pathology. You know, the posterior talar fibular ligament, the transverse ligament, the intermalleolus ligament, all form like a, a labrum to the back of the ankle joint. Of course, the bony anatomy is, um, is variable too. One can get an ostragonum, you can get a large um, stider type lesion, which is a, a large projection from the back of the talus. And then you can get a large superior calcaneus process. Um, also osteophytes of the end of the tibia, lots of little bony things that can cause, cause impingement. And of course, then there's also in the soft tissue component, the FH, FHL, which can be a source of pain with the tina synovitis or tina vaginitis. So lots of, lots of different things there. So um, the other things that can also cause um, posterior ankle impingement syndrome, you know, you've got to look quite carefully for pathology locally, like Achilles problems at the insertion, bursitis, serial nerve issues, tarsal tunnel. Often it's ridiculous pain. I've had a lot of patients referred for you know, posterior uh, ankle pain and they actually have an S1 ridiculous pain or L5 down the lateral side of the foot. So look for that and then tarsal coalitions, osteochondral lesions with referred pain. So just be careful. Um, and then uh, things that cause pain locally, styla lesion, ostragonum, subtalar pathology. So osteochondral lesions in the subtalar joints and all these other um, soft tissue problems and calcium This is, this is just show, the patient with the chronic lateral instability. As you can see, the positive the test. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's a positive drip, drip test there with a bit of a suction side. Carry on for it. And then uh, we do a, you can see it jumps there. That's a positive posterior impingement. So give it a short, sharp push and they, they jump. And most, most of these patients will have difficulty with downhill running when they're slowing down, playing soccer, um, when they have. Um, um, in certain dances going on point, that's when they have the most, most difficulty here. So we will usually start with radiographs. Sometimes they have an absolutely normal X-ray and, and significant soft tissue um, posterior ankle impingement syndrome. Um, but you can maybe see subtalar pathology or large ostragonum, stider process. We don't really use bone scanning too much. It's not quite um, specific enough, but pretty sensitive for any bony problem. And then um, if I see a uh, ostrigonum and it's the first presentation, I sometimes try a um, cortisone injection because in about 40% of the time, it'll take the pain away. And um, we can use ultrasound guidance. And, uh, and then if it, it persists and you need to get some more specific imaging, and I think an MRI scan is the gold standard to look for bone edema in the synchondrosis if it's an os. You can look for osteochondral lesions in the subtalar joints and FHR pathology. CT scan, a um, little less valuable, but perhaps if you combine it with a SPECT, maybe a bit more, a bit more valuable. What about this ostrigonum? Well, there's a secondary ossification center that fuses with the talus um, in a, when we're between seven and 12, and 14, seven to 14% of people doesn't fuse with the talus. So that's how many people have it. Um, what causes the pain with the syndrome when, you know, a lot of most patients who have it never know, never, never will know. But I think they have a, 
a, a sprain injury in most instances or like a stress or sudden plant deflection and they get pain in the area because there's either a fracture of the os, there's instability of the synchondrosis or um, they get bone bruising between the synchondrosis and the, and the actual talus. And then uh, obviously inflammation, synovitis in that area, you can see on this MRI scan, there's clearly bone bruising in that, in that synchondrosis, sorry, in that um, ostrigonum and there's fluid in that synchondrosis, and that's what it looks like on x -ray. Um, and then uh, just a word on, on um, ankle instability. If you think of these patients where the talus drifts forward like that, there's less room posteriorly when they go into plantar flexion and more likely to impinge. So a lot of these patients do have chronic lateral ankle instability and posterior um, impingement. So they often go together. And if you stabilize the lateral ligaments, then the posterior impingement improves because the talus doesn't drift forward so much. Yet. So there um, is just a, showing you that there's no ATFL, very wavy and a very large ostrigonum in the background who had a ligament reconstruction. So the non-surgical treatments depends on the pathology, but ultrasound, uh, sorry, ultrasound guided cortisone injection, what I usually start with. And, you know, 60% of people respond pretty well to conservative treatment. And the surgical management depends on what you have leading on to the goals and the sort of the appro approach. It's a bit of target territory posture immediately and laterally nervy, or the serial nerve. Those are the two sort of approaches, um, either posture medial or posture lateral approach to get to that ostrogonum through an open, open approach. Um, endoscopically, that's how I prefer to do it. Uh, once you know how to do it, it's a bit like getting into the subacromial space um, in shoulder surgery. It's a bit... Um, it's a bit disconcerting in the beginning because you can't really see anything. I think in the ankle, you've got to be a bit more careful because the neurovascular bundle is pretty close by and you get lost. You cut that yellow thing there, you're going to be calling your, your MPS. So it's worth doing in the lab first. Um, but yeah, I prefer to do it uh, endoscopically. And this is the way to do it is to go either side of the Achilles tendon. You make a little um, space for yourself using these, these landmarks. And um, you find the FHL, which is something that protects you from the neurovascular bundle and just stay lateral to the FHL. You gotta release the PITFL off the ostrigonum and uh, release the soft tissue. Sometimes you use osteotome and you can release, the, release that. Uh, the open techniques, there's sort of three approaches, very medial, postural medial, postural lateral, and uh, internervous planes. Relatively easy if you just be careful and uh, and you can take them out uh, like that. That's postromenial, postrolateral, and uh, post-op care. Generally, they take they can take about four months to to get back to um, ballet and those very on-point type exercises. Football about eight weeks, so they gen generally does does pretty well if you've got the got the diagnosis right. Uh. So what about that uh, open versus endoscopic? I don't call it arthroscopic because it's actually not, it's outside the joints. So it depends on um, your level of skill. Um, and also remember, patients want to get back to what they were doing as fast as possible. And so if you can do it endoscopically, I'm going to show you evidence to suggest that the complication rate is a bit lower and they can get back to sport a bit sooner doing it endoscopically. And um, we only have unfortunately, you know, quite low level of evidence to suggest this, but there are 16 studies with this meta-analysis and they, they pulled them and showed that, this is um, Nick van Dijk and them, that they had a shorter return to, to, to play and sport lower complication rates using the endoscopic technique. Um, and there's another one also, um, a randomized control trial comparing, this is level one evidence comparing open to endoscopic with um, more evidence. This, uh, another randomized control trial with five year follow-up showing better evidence um, not so long ago, 2017, that the endoscopic technique is probably a bit better. What about FHL pathology? Look, 
The Ostrigonum is usually very close to the FHL. <clears throat> you can get a tenosynovitis of the FHL, so you're able to treat it at the same time endoscopically. Whereas if you do it open, you'll never know. You can't. You, you try and avoid the FHL, so that's an advantage to doing it um, endoscopically. You can also perform a synovectomy all the way down the FHL tunnel. Um, you can um, then debride the tendon as well. Where you can see FHL gliding nicely. You see this fraying here that's from rubbing on the ostrigonum that's been removed this is another patient who had a stider lesion with a tiny fracture he ended up going to the olympics having just removed that little stider that broken stider lesion this is what it looked like there a little projection and uh you know she just take it off a little but so it's not all um it's not all just the ostrigonum that causes posterior ankle impingement. It's also here yeah, in this case a posterior osteochondral lesion together with an a, a, a ostrigonum. In this case, there's no fluid in the ostrigonum. He does have some insertional Achilles tendinopathy. I'll give you that much, but you can see there's a osteochondral lesion there. So endoscopically, you're allowed, you're, you're able to treat both of these um, pathologies. So just looking at the FHL. And that's the, os the osteochondral lesion here at the back of the talus, and um, and and we're able to get rid of it, get get the um, ostrigonum out the way and microfracture the uh, the um, ost uh, osteochondral lesion, and he got back to play. There's a patient with a large posterior ganglion, which we managed to aspirate. So it's not all bony problems. This is a ganglion presented exactly like posterior ankle impingement only seen on, on MRI or ultrasound. This is a patient with a large stider lesion and osteochondral lesion of the distal tibia. You can see it's a very slight signal there, but in terminal plant deflection, a lot of pain in the back of the ankle. And at arthroscopy, you can have a look into the ankle joint. This is looking from behind. You can see this denuded cartilage and had a microfracture. And then, uh, and then also, the stider lesion was trimmed so that that impingement was less. <clears throat> so the multiple causes of posterior impingement, bony and soft tissue, a fair percentage respond well to a cortisone and, uh, and a period of anti-inflammatories and rest. You can do it endoscopically or open. I've got advantages and disadvantages, but um, slightly higher trend to recovery in, a bit faster in the endoscopic technique. Yeah. So any questions on, on impingement syndromes? You guys are still awake. You've just got the zoom in the background. We're still here, bro. <laughs> it's 55 minutes. Uh, it's impressive listening. I hope my video has caught your attention. So I'm not going to spend much longer. This is the last topic because I can only do an hour on a Tuesday. Um, on uh, on turf toe injuries. Now, these are much less common injuries than all of those that I've mentioned. And as I said before, we're going to cover peroneal tendon tears, list rank injuries, stress fractures, and other talks. But this is one that I want you to just um, maybe not miss. It's quite a serious injury. It's usually in a contact situation very common in American football. In fact, a friend of mine designed a shoe in, he's in Minneapolis to try and prevent turf toe and this rank injuries. It's an NFL uh, shoe because the turf there is, is obviously astroturf, it's very unforgiving. And when another quarterback or I don't know what the positions are in the NFL, but when, when another player lands on the, on the back of your leg like this and your fo foot's forced into dorsiflexion, you rupture the whole plant of plate you can tear the um, or fracture the the sesamoids and get a very unstable situation. You can see on this radiograph here, this the normal position of the sesamoids is retracted. Um, <clears throat> there are different grades of turf toes. I can't remember who is the name is behind it, but it's pretty much like any orthopedic grade. Grade three, very bad dislocated, torn everything, grade two, kind of stable, um, quite tender, but the jaw tests perhaps not as positive, and grade one is just a sort of minor sprain. 
the grades ones and twos would treat the patient with this thing. It's called a Morton's graphite splint or graphite plate, limits dorsiflexion, and perhaps tape the toe into plantar flexion, regardless of any hallux injury, whether it's a grade one, or grade two, or even a, just a medial collateral injury. You can tell the patient they're going to have pain in the big toe for six months, and um, and they may not be able to play for three or four months. Uh, it's just a bad injury when you tear those ligaments. It's such a lot of force through the hallux, certainly when running and jumping and sprinting. This is the test that you need to do um, when the swelling and the, sort of the acute pain is settled down. It's a draw test. And just uh, like any sort of Lachman type of test. And then you can't just compare it to the other side. So usually the, there shouldn't be too much motion in patients who don't have too much ligament laxity in the sagittal plane. Um, and then, and then uh, the next investigation I do is a standing x-ray of both feet together, looking at position of the sesamoids and then measure what they are uh, in, on the two sides. In this x-ray, it's very clear. Sesamoids are retracted back as if an, even a fracture of the tibial one on the left, obviously indicating a severe injury. And, um, and then uh, certainly um, to back your diagnosis up, if the x-rays aren't as obvious as they were and, and there's not that much retraction, you get an MRI scan, which is pretty good at delineating the plantar plate and that um, gap between the sesamoid and the P1, showing fluid going in there. And uh, yeah, on a grade three injury, they need surgery. Unfortunately, it's quite a hectic, op you've got to do an L-J-shaped incision and um, visualize the, the plantar plate protect the, the digital nerves and neurovascular bundle, and then repair the plantar plate with, um, depends on where it's come off, it's usually ripped off the P1. So you need to repair it back to the P1 with uh, suture anchors. Or if it's come off the sesamoids, you can put the anchors into the sesamoids. And um, in some instances, you have to excise some of the sesamoids like we did in that case. So this is that patient where the sesamoids are retracted and we excise the one pole of the sesamoid um, uh, so that was another patient but in this case we excised the one pole of the sesamoid and we repaired uh, what we could there and uh, and then yeah, that's what the incision looks like afterwards uh. so yeah, devastating injury career ending in some patients and um, yeah quite a quite an uncommon sports injury but one one worth mentioning uh. Cool, yeah, that's uh, that's an R up there. Eh? So there any 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 questions on that? Uh, Graham, can I ask you something about um, ligamentous injuries or ankle sprains? Yeah. Um, in the acute setting, <clears throat> um, when they present to you, is there any specific clinical indication or maybe even something on the history? You know, other than being Dwayne Vermeulen, that would make you MRI them early rather than waiting for a few, uh, giving them four weeks in the brace. No, oh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, the Ottawa ankle rules were established so that Canadians wouldn't even x ray ankle sprains because most ankle sprains don't even need an x ray. I think that's, that's pretty, I would agree with that. I think it depends on, on, your, on your clinical examination. So, my trigger for an MRI would be if there's pain going up the interosseous ligament, if there's a big medial injury, so that means the deltoids involved, which indicates that the talus, if it's a supination injury, that talus tilts at 90 degrees. Um, if they're not able to weight bear after 10 days to two weeks, and uh, of course, if there's if there are other syndesmotic type um, involvement on clinical examination or external rotation test, squeeze test and um, maybe increased fibula translation in the sagittal plane. But uh, I, yeah, it's very uncommon at all that uh, Dwayne Vermeulen had a classic syndesmotic external rotation type injury. So in those cases, I always get an MRI scan because of the high incidence of an osteochondral lesion where 40% of patients with a syndesmotic in injury, that external rotation component, I think it's just quite a lot more sheer with that external rotation. So to answer your question, um, rarely, but if, if there was a 
um, syndesmotic component on examination or suspicion, then that's when, or failure to weight bear, or if there's a plateau in recovery, but later down the line, you know, would pull the trigger. But many times it'll show a bone bruise, and bone bruising is benign unless it's subchondral. It takes six months, and it's been shown in the tibia with ACLs. It's quite benign, but it can lead to chronic pain. You know that, that sort of weight bearing pain for a long, long time. So anyway, it's nice to know, and you can tell the patients why it's still sore if there's a big bone bruise of the tailor neck or the tailor body. So yeah, that would be. But otherwise, um, I think ankle sprains certainly in our environment are um, probably over investigated. They, will, you know, they get an ultrasound. I mean, clearly it's so over the ATFL. Ultrasound shows the ATFL is torn. Well, you can you can diagnose that clinically. But the the other the other time I think it's very is useful to get further imaging would be if there's pain um, over the peroneals. It can be a bit difficult. With because the CFL is very closely related to the peroneals, it runs underneath them. So a tear of the CFL will be pretty sore. And that's right where the where you'll palpate the peroneal tendons. But if there's sort of pain along a bit more proximal over the peroneal tendons or a bit more distant where there's a bit of cavus, then um uh I would um Perhaps get further imaging on the ultrasound or MRI pain over the peroneals would be another another indication. Yeah. Thank you. I think in these uh, in the professional sportsmen's a bit different. They need to know the treat the surgeon or the treating doctors need to know, so they, they kind of get a scan straight away. And they will they will cover it with insurance. But um the weekend warriors and general public certainly not not everyone needs a scan. No. So I mean, there, there are lots of other injuries that we haven't touched on, like um, you know spring ligament sprains and Liss Franks and um, stress fractures, plantar plate instability of the second, all very common in runners. <clears throat> And stuff, but um, we kind of cover that in other other lectures in the in the two year cycle. Okay, you guys, are right? Eh? Someone, any other questions here? Eh?